Um, as you well know, uh, the SOAS Director's Lecture Series focuses on the planetary questions of our time and how to enable a collective response, human response to them. In this historical moment, all of our big challenges, pandemics, climate change, inequality, social and political polarization, all are transnational in character and require a cohering of the human community. We reflect on these challenges and try to bring insights to them from what we describe uh, as the majoritarian world. Today, we're going to, of course, discuss uh, partition. Last year, as you well know, was the 75th anniversary of the partition of India. And as writer and author Salil Tripathi reflected in foreign policy, when Jawaharlal Nehru addressed the nation in August 1947 with his Trist of Destiny speech, it was truly remarkable for its awareness of the tasks that lay ahead of this nation. Jawaharlal Nehru spoke of a secular India. He spoke of, of a sudden solidarity. He spoke of cohering the human community into a much more powerful collective cohesive entity. Yet today, India is a very, very different place under Modi's leadership. And what we want to ask is how different is present day India from what the founders had envisaged uh, some 75 years ago. Of course, it's worth saying that the past partition was in many, in many ways a tragic moment. Millions of people died in the subcontinent. Tens of millions of people were uprooted and it ushered in, uh, in its wake, three separate nations ultimately. What is today known as India, what is of course Pakistan, and what is um, known as Bangladesh. And today, what we want to understand is what does partition, what was the partition about? What were its origins? But more importantly, how is the partition understood in contemporary India, in contemporary Pakistan, in contemporary Bangladesh? And what does that imagination of what partition represented and what these societies have begun, become, what does that mean for the world that we live in? What does it mean for the world that we need to build? And what does it mean for the cosmopolitan vision of the world that we require if we are going to survive as a human species in the next century or two? Today, we have two colleagues uh, to speak to us. Uh, about this. Um, of course, we have Salil Trip Tripathi, who's the author of The Colonel Who Would Not Repent, The Bangladesh War and Its Unquiet Legacy, which was long listed for the Nonfiction Award at the Tata Literature, Literature Live Festival in Mumbai in 2016. He has also written a collection of travel writing detours, Songs of the Open Road and a book on threats to freedom of expression from Hindu nationalism, offense, the Hindu case. Uh, his next book is about Gujaratis. He has also co-edited in your tongue, I cannot fit with the artist Shilpa Gupta about imprisoned poets through the centuries. His journalism has won awards in Asia and the United States. And he has of course been published widely in the UK US and India and elsewhere. He has written academic papers on business and human rights. Um, and he was born in Mumbai, lived in Singapore, Hong Kong and London, and is of course now based in New York. Um, our second speaker is Dr. Aditi Kumar, an art historian and cultural practitioner who was of course born in Jammu, Kashmir, her scholarship interrogates the role of art and culture in the formation of post-colonial nation states 
and national as well as regional identities in the global south. In particular, she has worked to redefine the intellectual scope of art history as a discipline with reference to the Caribbean, South Asia, and diaspora communities in Europe, specifically in the UK. Particularly, she has worked uh, on Jammu and Kashmiri diaspora living in the UK. Dr. Kumar has shown how scholarship may interact more creatively with global histories, museum and exhibition curation, cultural public policy, and the public understanding of art. Through public and academic engagement as an academic fellow at the Warwick Interdisciplinary Research Center for International Development, she is in the process of materializing her research into a manuscript. Dr. Kumar is also a lecturer in the humanities and social sciences at the University of Roehampton in London. So friends, colleagues, I am uh, going to recommend the following. We're going to allow uh, Salil to, of course, have a conversation with us to speak for about 10, uh, 12 minutes on how he sees things playing out in India, what he sees as what partition represented, and more importantly, how India and Bangladesh in many ways are different from how it was originally imagined by their founders. And then of course, we'll go to Aditi Kumar for another uh, 10 to 12 uh, minutes of introduction where she will speak to many of these issues, but also not only focus on India and Bangladesh, but also uh, Pakistan. And then hopefully we will take a conversation from there with each one of them. I will of course allow questions to be raised through the chat line and we will have a conversation up until uh, just before 7 uh, p.m. So uh, thank you once again uh, for joining us. It's a real pleasure to have you at the first director lecture series for the calendar year 2023. And may I ask you, Salil, uh, to lead us in your first introductory statement. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction and almost intimidating because I'm with two senior academics and I don't have a PhD. I don't have a background in law, but I'm an observer and writer. So I'll speak more as an observer and writer and draw from books that I've written both on Hindu nationalism and on Bangladesh. As we go along, I'll speak a little bit about Bangladesh and about India in the reverse order, first start with India and then with Bangladesh. And really look forward to questions and a very stimulating session at SOAS, which is, um, you know, as one of my great friends, uh, a young woman called Shela Rashid at JNU calls it the JNU in London. And I think all of you will agree that that's a great compliment to SOAS when someone calls it the JNU in London. And I'll leave it at that. You refer to my, my piece in foreign policy on peace with destiny. And I think what Nehru said at that time was very critical about the narrative of separating and distinguishing India from what it was and what it could have been, the secular versus the religious. Now this secularism that Nehru spoke about was of course Indian secularism which was inspired by Gandhi and which meant equal respect for all religions and not what the French would call, which is, you know, the laicite and, you know, keeping religion out of the public sphere. In fact, the school I went to, uh, I went to a Gujarati medium school in Bombay when I was a young student and uh, all religions were respected and all religions prayers were spoken. I mean, I, I mean, agnostic bearing towards atheism. So I don't have much time for that, but I can understand the rationale for it. And I think that was fine. But the one thing every Indian knows about and doesn't talk about is a mass violence that accompanied the partition. That's the first narrative we have to remember. That the nation was vivisected. It was divided into two, with two halves on each side, East Pakistan, which was largely Bengali, and I'll come to that when I speak about Bangladesh shortly, 
and West Pakistan, which was Punjabi and Urdu. Two halves, which were supposed to be home for Muslims, because the argument within was that India, the centerpiece, was a home for Hindus. Gandhi didn't agree with that. Maulana Azad didn't agree with that. Nehru didn't agree with that. Sardar Patel didn't agree with that. They all said that India was a home for everybody. But many Muslims felt unsafe and they left. And in some ways, they were right, the way India has turned out today. But I'll come to that also towards the end of my presentation. So for a long time, the national narrative in India remained that secularism was better. I have many liberal Pakistani friends who look with awe at India because they felt that India had done something right, which they hadn't, because progressively, Pakistan on the West and in Bangladesh on the East turned more and more Islamic in ways which ended up undermining human rights. But India didn't have an easy ride. If you look at the history of India since independence, it has been unpleasant. The emergency of 1975, was the first major shock to the system because it showed that the institutions could collapse very easily. I'm not a huge fan of V.S. Naipaul, but in his book, India, A Wounded Civilization, he has this phrase, and I'm speaking from memory, so I'm not quoting it accurately, that the press, the parliament, and judiciary were borrowed institutions. The press, when it was asked to bend, it crawled, as L.K. Advani, one of the ministers, later said. The parliament became a rubber stamp, and the judiciary approved everything. The famous Jabalpur case, I mean, who can forget that, right? When the Attorney General of India says that the government has a right to deny the right to life, and the judiciary went along with it. So you have that on one hand. Then you move to 1980s. And you see three major things happening. One, the disappearance of the idea of non-alignment, something that Nehru believes in. Nehru has sworn by it. He's part of the Bandung process. He genuinely believes in, in the fact that, you know, you could be neither US, nor, I mean, John Foster Dulles may have called it an immoral choice, but that's exactly where he was. But the non-alignment ended because there was no longer a Soviet Union to fight. You have two cases in India. One is the Shahbanu case, where there is a genuine concern about the rights of Muslim women to seek alimony and the ban on satanic verses. And the third is the end of socialism, as we knew it. What did the Congress party of Nehru and Gandhi have to offer? It was a chasm, it was a gap. And it was in that gap that the Babri Masjid was destroyed in 1992. There were major shocks to the system. On one hand, we saw that a lot of people actually liked what happened. Those who lived in Delhi, those who lived in the big cities felt that this was terrible and it couldn't be countenanced and could not be supported. But a lot of people said, fine, we've taught them a lesson and the them were the Muslims, right? And then we move forward by another 10 years and we have the massacres in Gujarat in 2002 under Narendra Modi, who was the chief minister. And I don't really want to go into the details of the BBC documentary. I do hope people in London have seen it and people elsewhere have seen it through some other means. But the film very clearly and demonstrably shows the problems that occurred. The fact that the state was either incompetent or complicit in what happened. But the crucial factor we have to remember is that, that the same party continues to get elected. It is popular. And that alternative narrative includes several things that have happened in the last few years. And I'll, I'll go very briefly into explaining why. One is projecting the non-Nehru, non-Gandhi universe as heroes. Project Bhagat Singh as a hero, even though he was a communist. Projecting Ambedkar as a hero, even though he would cringe at the thought of being adopted by Hindu nationalists. Projecting Sardar Patel as a hero and building the world's tallest statue in, in Gujarat about a man who 
who had banned the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, the fountainhead of BJP's ideology, and protected Subhash Chandra Bose as a hero. Uh, you know, the man who founded the Indian National Army, not founded, he was the second inheritor. Mohan Singh actually founded it in 1943. Bose came later. But what Bose did, and if, if you see his politics, it was progressive, leftist, integrationist, and something that was closer to the Gandhian ideal of, of integration than what the BJP and the RSS want. But these are the people that are being projected today as a heroes for two aims. One, to show that Nehru was a playboy and undermine his reputation continuously. And Gandhi was India's janitor. He believed in cleaning India, clean India. And so if you listen to Modi, whenever he speaks about Gandhi, he talks about swachhata, as in cleanliness, as the thing that Gandhi wanted, completely ignoring all the other things that Gandhi has fought for, such as equal respect for religion, human rights, and so on. Concurrently, what he will not say it himself, but people around him will say, are projecting two other heroes. One is Savarkar, who was a right-wing Hindu nationalist who coined the phrase Hindutva and was in um, the Andaman jails for a long time and wrote many mercy petitions to get free. And Nathuram Gurse, the man who shot Gandhi and killed him. It's almost like America were to worship John Wilkes Booth over Lincoln. Or if America were to worship someone like uh, Lee Harvey Oswald or John Kennedy. But that's where we have come. A bridge was to be named after Goodse. Plays are being written about him, praising him. Films are, and why is this happening? And this is where the statistic comes in. And this is where I want to end up by talking about India. Is that more than half the population today in India is under 25. And more than 65% is under 35. In 2021, about 26% of India's population was between the 0 to 14 years category and about 68% was between 15 and 64 years category. People who remember the past are fading and people who don't remember the past or who don't care about the past are around. They are getting information about quote-unquote Muslim tyranny, quote-unquote Hindi superiority, an un unabashed spread of and speaking of Hindu nationhood to WhatsApp messages. And it's almost like you're talking about two parallel universes. And, and the interesting part is that, you know, that Gandhi's 150th anniversary was in 2019, and Narendra Modi wrote an article, obviously someone else wrote it for him because it couldn't have been Modi's writing um, uh, in the New York Times about it. And the interesting part is exactly that, that the BJP leaders are speaking about Gandhi and Nehru when they're abroad. At home, they praise Godse and Savarkar because they know very well that if they were to project Godse and Savarkar abroad, they will be laughed out because nobody knows them and they know that what they represent was evil. But we are on 21st of February and now I'm switching from India to Bangladesh here. And I want to recall a poem by Tarfia Faizullah, who's an American Bangladeshi poet. And here's a poem. Each week I pull hard, the water from the well, bathe in my sari, wring it out, beat it against the flattest rocks. Are you Muslim or Bengali? They ask me again and again, both. I said, both. I wrote a book on Bangladesh and its struggle for freedom. And I'm, I'm born a Gujarati and I can speak Bengali. I chose to learn the language. And one of the things I learned was, you know, the strong hold that the language has on the people's nationalism. One has to look at the narrative of 1947 in Bangladesh. Because Bangladesh's history doesn't only begin in 1947, it goes back to 1935, it goes back to 1905 when Karzan divided the land. The borders between East Pakistan and India were open till 1964. I mean, I, when I wrote my book on Bangladesh, I met Bangladeshi men and women who said they used to come to 
Calcutta to see the new Satyajit Ray films, buy saris and shondesh and go back. This is what used to be. But then you have the language movement, and that goes back to 21st of February, which is Ekushir Boimela today, uh, the, the, the World Mother Language Day, and it is recognized as such because of Bangladesh and, and Bangla national event for language. That language movement was extremely important. Six people were certainly killed, maybe more were killed. We don't have the full figures. And that followed with the six point program. And from 65 to 71 was a brief period where the antagonism between West and East Pakistan magnified, leading to the massacres of 1971. Whether 150,000 people died or 3 million people died is for statistician. I really don't care, but a lot of people died. It was certainly a crime against humanity, probably a genocide, and it's something for which there was a lack of justice. If you go to the Martyrs Memorial at Rayer Bazar in Dhaka, which I have, and every time I go to Dhaka, I've not been back since 2015, so which was some time ago, I see an engraved poem written there in Bangla, which says, does Bangladesh speak what you wanted it to say? People in Bangladesh need to ask themselves if the Digital Security Act, the jailing of journalists, the killing of bloggers, and the abuses of human rights that are going on, is it consistent with the kind of country that Mujibur Rahman wanted to create? I'm not a Bangladeshi. It's not for me to prescribe solutions for that. But it's a question that Bangladesh does need to reckon with. But the question that ultimately, led, and I'll end with this, is to recall what Fahmida Riyaz said, a Pakistani poet. And she said this when Babri Masjid was destroyed in India. Tum bilkul ham jaise nikle, ab tak kaha chupe te bhai? Mu murak tha, wo ghamanpan, jisme hamne sadi gwai. For a centenary, we were fooled into believing something else, but you turned out to be just like us. Where were you hiding till now? And this is a question that India has to reckon because the way India is moving now is on a trajectory that confirms every fear, every suspicion that a Muslim in the subcontinent had of a Hindu dominated India and what it would do to them and Gandhi and Nehru convinced everybody that it's not like that, that we are different. We are liberal, we are Democrats. But the people in charge of India today think otherwise. They are building a new narrative, which is dangerous and the world ignores it at its peril. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salil. It's, uh, it's a powerful words, and we'll of course come. There are many questions there. I want to immediately shift to Aditi. Yeah. Um, and Aditi, I want to give you uh, obviously uh, 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 12, 15 minutes to, to make your comments, introductory comments, and then I will start off the conversation and then we'll come to look at what others, others say. But Aditi, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Adam, for your wonderful uh, introduction. And of course, I'll try to do justice to what my predecessor has spoken about. And, uh, and thank you for the wonderful audience who is listening to us now. And before I start, my, I, I would rather say it's not a research uh, you know, piece that I'm going to present, but rather a conversation that I would like to engage everybody into. And before I make that, uh, I start with the conversation, I would like to make one thing clear that I'm not looking at politics per se of Kashmir Valley, but rather of a contested belt that is known as, um, uh, you know, Azad Kashmir in Pakistan and POK or Pakistan occupied Kashmir. So I'd rather call it contested regions and uh, of Jammu and Kashmir. And that's the area I've been working in collecting material culture for the past 10 years. And my PhD is also based on uh, cultural artifacts, items of memorabilia and photographs, which I very painstakingly collected over seven, eight years from the diaspora families, specifically those who, who were based in Jammu and um, Delhi and other Northern parts of India. 
So uh, I also find myself very privileged and fortunate to have access to diaspora and displaced families that are based in India and the families that migrated to the UK. And that's, uh, I'll also give you a very brief historical, uh, you know, background of uh, the diaspora community I specifically looked into. And these people belonged to uh, Mirpur region and adjoining area. So there is this small belt, which India till date, uh, you know, politically claims that it's the part of, you know, that, that the crown, which we see on the map of the India is actually not there, because that portion is administratively and politically, it is part of Pakistan. So that diaspora um, migrated after partition, uh, specifically the Muslim communities to the United Kingdom. And it was also uh, the time when, uh, you know, United Kingdom was undergoing nation building. So a lot of people from South Asia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India, they migrated to this, uh, to, to United Nations. And um, having said that, so there was a duality in terms of this migration, like in my work, I say like Palestine, these people could never return back to their homes. Because under the, uh, you know, development plan in Pakistan, uh, a dam was built. So that the whole belt went under the Mangla Dam waters. So the people could never go back or revisit their homes because they are lost. But every year, once the monuments, they are resurrected, you know, because when the dam water goes up, down uh, in the month of March, uh, I believe, so a mosque comes out and a Hindu temple comes out. So it's very interesting how these commemorative sites become active spaces of cultural unification. So it's uh, dating back, uh, I was, uh, you know, recording in, um, you know, narrative from first generation partition survivor. So he happened to visit that part of, uh, you know, uh, POK back in two, 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 uh, two, two zero, uh, 2004, when, uh, you know, as there was this bus service which was started called uh, by the Indian government for the Hindu families to visit those areas. So he got the picture of uh, the Hindu temple, which was brought back with him along with the sand of the land. And that image became a commodity, uh, a religious, you know, photograph, which was circulated among the community members. And as you know, a lot of Hindus have domestic shrines, or they have their in-house shrines. So may I, it, I was amazed to find that image in the domestic shrines of these families. So the, how culture is kind of reimagined and how sacred geographies are reinstated in new spaces, that's really interesting to see. So again, I, I will take the, as an, I'm an art historian, I will really emphasize on, uh, you know, factors which what Adam raised that how we are going to imagine this new world, a cosmopolitan world. So is it through the divisive politics that, you know, the um, uh, your hegemonic uh, partition narrative has been going on or who owns the narrative? It's actually the narrative of the people, by the people and for the people. So it's only now when the scholarship, which actually focuses on social and cultural aspects of partition came about maybe three day, uh, three decades ago. If, uh, you know, Urvashi Batalia, who popularly wrote The Other Side of Silence, Ritu Menon, and other scholars who really, you know, uh, who really brought human stories of partition, just not that. The, and of course, nobody can deny the genocide that happened on both sides of the border. And we are still, you know, embroiled in that violent conflict. We say our part, it's ongoing. It has not stopped even after 75 years. But it's important to take into factor the stories which talk about human, you know, solidarity and friendships and, you know, different stories. So this, uh, I, I, I know the time is tight. So I will really want to showcase a story which really touched my heart. And I've been fortunate to be a part of their lives now. So when I was in India, when I was doing my PhD from JNU, so uh, because of uh, you know certain factors, I could not travel to the UK 
under Charles Wallet's scheme to really document those uh, families who had come from, uh, you know, um, uh, Pakistan administered Jammu and Kashmir. So uh, I was just on telephone and I took the interviews on the phone. So I got to know about a person called Zulfika Ali, who is uh, who has his family based in Birmingham right now. And his mother was basically a Hindu girl who was left behind, like many other stories, like we see in, uh, uh, you know, Kiran Kher's movie, Kalapani and others. So many movies have Pinjar. So she was left behind and she married a Muslim man. And then um, she came to the UK. And that's how, and as, as you know, that women had no agency. So the state decided what the fate of these women would be. So they went multiple types of violence, you know. One, uh, you know, a Hindu or a Muslim, vice versa, they were married into different religions. And then they were extracted from their homes after many years. And uh, mind you, uh, many of these women have already born children with new marriages, you know. So they, they were not asked if they want to really go back. But under the state scheme, which was, you know, Repatriation Act, as we know it, these women were exchanged between both the countries. So the story of uh, Ved Kumari Akka Fatima B is one of those women who didn't want to, uh, you know, go back. So um, I'll just show you, uh, I think I can share the image. So this is the image of Fatima B in uh, the UK when she was settled here. This is her son who's doing really well. And now he himself is 75 years old and she's no more though. So this is when they relocated and they were well established here. And uh, so I really wanted to talk about her identity as a, you know, a Hindu slash Muslim woman. And she was not allowed to go back to meet her parents back in Jammu. It was only 40 years of, you know, rejected visas, rejections, and finally due to, you know, the persistent efforts of her son, Zulfikar Ali, whom you see in the left side of the photograph, that she was finally able to reunite with her family back in Jammu. And this is her, and this is what's very interesting that when she went back to India and Jammu particularly, she wears a bindi, which is a signal of a married Hindu woman. So the kind of duality of identities which people navigated through is really fascinating. And another story that touched my heart was her brother didn't marry till the sister came back, revisited. So when the sister got back for 40, after 40 years, she got her brother married and she was able to attend that. So these amazing and rare, uh, you know, family albums really help you to see the other part of partition, which otherwise is silenced. So, um, you know, I, I really f find this, uh, you know, material so fascinating and so rare that hardly pe people don't have this material. Like this old woman who said, Ki, uh, in Punjabi, I'll say it and I'll translate the mother had to throw the children you know in the river because the breast had no more milk to feed the children so it was so gruesome and to ask them if you have a photograph or if you have an image is kind of you know it's something which really puts you in a very tight spot as a researcher and this another story is for, of a sick person whom I met who is no more, unfortunately. And he said, um, and I met him a couple of times in Jammu and he didn't open up with his stories or, you know, personal stories. And as I went and, you know, I won his trust. So one fine day I was like, okay, Bauji, uh, uh, like I'm now stop, I'll stop visiting you. I have to go back to Delhi. And that day, he very slowly, he went inside his room and there was, you know, the old lockers, the brass lockers, which you move slowly, you know, which uh, had uh, jewelry and et cetera, valuables inside. He opens it up and he brings something very guardingly towards me. And it's wrapped into multiple polythene bags. And I was like, something precious he's going to show me. And he comes out from the, you know, he takes out this ubiquitous brass glass. I was quite astounded. Why is he showing me this? You know, because a brass glass was a thing which you found in many partitioned families because they wanted to drink water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he said, "This is the only thing which remains of partition with me." 
And because I was a soldier and I was escaping the marauders and the killers of the, from the opposite side, and I only had this glass and uh, I survived on alcohol or water and whatever I carried in this glass. So this is the souvenir of partition. This is my family, uh, you know, uh, what say, me memories are attached to this one glass. So objects really unfold the other stories of partition which often got, you know, hidden and uh, not spoken about. So I would uh, just like to end here. And I hope this gives us some food for our thought and opens up who really, you know, owns this uh, narrative of partition, even after 75 years. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, Aditi. I think you both of you and Salil have, have given us very fruitful understandings of the challenge of, of, of partition. Um, if you could take out that, uh, yeah. uh, but the, what I wanted to pose is a question, you know, it seems to me what is important, I mean, partition is important for the people that were, were, were involved in it and for the experiences of how it defined uh, the three nations. But it seems to me that it's also speaks to our contemporary world in many ways. Uh, because at the heart of partition is two visions of the human community. Vision one is humans are defined by their identity in very, very rigid terms, whether that is a racial identity or whether it is a religious identity. And there's a second vision in the battle of partition that human beings can be see themselves beyond the hum, their rigid identities. They can live together. They can be part uh, of a collective human community. And in a sense, the one perspective ironically in partition that emerges, it emerges in Pakistan very early on as an Islamic state. But India represented this, the alternative, the possibility of a more cosmopolitan nation. And it seems to me that that was the two uh, perspectives that were, were defining uh, partition. If you forward uh, for 75 years later, that battle is still playing out, but this time it's playing out in Western Europe where particularistic identities are emerging. In places like the United States where very particularistic identities are emerging. Uh, and yet that same battle is, is playing out. And ironically, in India, as Salil says, there seems to be a return or a retreat into more particularistic identities. And I wanted to ask both of you, if you could think for us how partition speaks to the contemporary world, what partition means for the contemporary world, and why you think it is something that we should be constantly thinking about and not forgetting. And I, I want to come back to you, Salil, and of course I'll come back to you, Aditi. Uh, tell me why you think we should be writing about it, thinking about it, reflecting about it in the ways that we do. Salil. Yeah, so I think that's a great question and it will keep us busy for the next few hours if we were to really dig deep into it. But I do think that the idea of what constitutes a nation, and you know, I go back, you know, I'm not an academic, but I go back to what Ben Anderson wrote about in Imagine Communities and, and, and you know, about Indonesia, about a common understanding to forge an identity through words and through ideas, I mean, through print, right? Which is what Ben Anderson talks about in Imagine Communities. And if you look at the rise of nationalism in India, it was pretty much like that. Rise of nationalism in many countries was through the elite who are thinking about a specific identity to get rid of the colonial power. And, and there was a liberal imperative behind it. You know, The whole idea of building it around a notion that everybody was equal. And it's, it, it's, you know, it sounds almost laughable for someone with an Indian heritage like me talking about that today, given what has become of India. But the fact remains that we believed it. I mean, you know, I mean, 
my parents believed in it and my grandparents believed in it. Some of them fought and you know took part in the Gandhian struggles and it was a flawed struggle. I mean, it was not a perfect struggle. I mean, you know, Gandhi had his own flaws about the way he looked at Dalit, the way he looked at blacks and all that. So I'm not trying to whitewash him at all here, but there was something noble about his endeavor about bringing people together. And, and to see this whole, you know, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari and from Kabul, no, 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 Kabul is too far, but let's say at least certainly from, from Baluchistan to let's say Bangladesh, as one entity of a common civilization. Uh, I mean, who would argue against it? I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, I've been out of India for 30 years. And, you know, whenever I speak about Bollywood music or cricket, you know, all the bonds break apart and we all become friends again, you know, and, and everybody forgets about when we're talking about kanduri chicken and so on. But, but that's not the point. The point here is that there is a commonality of a culture, commonality of civilization, which I think Gandhi, Nehru, and others understood. I think Jinnah also understood that. But Jinnah understood also the Hindu nationalist feelings, and he was afraid of that. And that's why he built the barriers. And as I quoted the Fahmi Dariya's poem, you know, I mean, you, those of us who believed in a secular liberal ideal of India now have to question, were we wrong? Because we were taken in by the Gandhian rhetoric, not realizing that the undercurrent was so poisonous. Aditi, you want to come in? Yes, I would uh, uh, just add on to what Salil is already saying. And I would, of course, there are very now strong, um, what say, positions that people put because society is not without politics. Even if I'm saying a, I'm apolitical, that's really diplomatic. I am political, whether the food I'm eating, you know, the culture or the identity I'm performing, it's also the performance of identity. And, uh, you know, going back to what you were saying, uh, uh, you know, Adam, these kind of, uh, the identities that we are navigating now, more so, have become... Uh, you know, uh, more prominent because we are getting conscious of our multiple identities. You know, within India, if you say one part is wants to be identified as this and the uh, the addition of new states or Uttarakhand or, you know, so, if, so we are very conscious of what our identities are. And I think if we, uh, you know, if we give in to these very strong, for instance, I'll give you a very recent case of what happened at Leicester like a couple of months ago. Uh, hmm. over a cricket match between India and Pakistan. So, you know, it became volatile. It it took on a communal color, you know. There were, uh, you know, youths, uh, the Muslim youth and the right-wing Hindu youth. So the Hindu uh, youth from, uh, you know, uh, what say, ABB or the BJP, they started chanting um, uh, uh, Ram, you know, Ram ki jai ho. You know, it's a very religiously uh, driven chant. And that kind of instigated the other community. And there was, you know, a flag was pulled down from a Hindu temple and they were circulating, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if it's doctored because I didn't in person see it, but there were flag burning videos, which kind of became very volatile. And there was police all over Midlands and it kind of, it was a trigger point for rest of the Midlands. So the riot spread. So if you see the, the, the political position which India is taking right now and the very strong, stringent right or left, uh, you know, positions have deeper impact on the diaspora itself. So I feel we have to, as society, you know, we have to be very careful to not get influenced by the political realities of the homeland. But some I, of the balance, yeah. Uh, so I want to come back to both of you. You see, both Salil and uh, Aditi, you, make the argument that where we wrong, Salil puts it very provocatively, where we wrong, did Nehru and Gandhi and the Congress leadership uh, mislead us? But isn't there another explanation? And that is, to be fair, India survived for many decades as a secular state in some form or the other. And maybe we need the answer to look at how did Congress fail? It's, mm. it could not, it's failure of delivery to poor people. 
its economic crisis, the corruption in the place. You know, we say that young people by their very character, I hear this debate all the time about young people going to be revolutionary. But the question that is emerging is what you're saying to me, 65% of India is less than 35. They're young people, but they're not necessarily revolutionary. That they actually maybe people have lost hope and is Modi's project, the Hindutva project, not a product of the failure of the liberal establishment to deliver social justice to poor people. That this is what was not that we were, that the cosmopolitan leadership was wrong. It is they did not take social justice seriously. That it was all about liberal rights as opposed to delivering on this, the real needs of people. And is that not an explanation? that allows the right to emerge as opposed to, and I want to pose that as an alternative explanation to you, Salil, and to you, Aditi. I completely agree with you, Adam, on, on many, many, many respects. I think I've touched upon it a little bit by pointing out the three things that happened in the 80s, uh, preceded by the emergency, because the emergency broke the contract, the social contract between the Indian people and the Indian government. Because Indian government till the emergency 1975 was always Congress. And what was the Congress? Gandhi, Nehru, Patel, Azad, blah, blah, blah. And then Indira Gandhi. But then Indira Gandhi comes along and her attorney general says that the right to life is not a right in the Jabalpur case. The media is asked to bend and the media chooses to crawl. The bureaucracy is rubber stamping everything that the government wants. Sterilization takes place and you have a period when you have a country which is moving away from its democratic moors. And, and so that's the first shock. The second shock is, of course, the assassination of Indira Gandhi in 1984. And then in 1992, the, the, the destruction of the Babri Masjid. And all of this basically happens at a time when the world is changing, right? You, India has aligned, it's, it's non-aligned, but it's still largely seen as an ally of the Soviet Union. But Soviet Union ceases to exist. And so socialism doesn't matter. Secularism is being questioned because of what you see with, with Shahbanu case and the, and the Salman Rushdie ban case. And, and, and in every which, which way you look at in India at that time, it looks as though the existing order needs to change. And it's in that vacuum that the BJP makes its mark because it was waiting. Like communists, BJP is a fundamentalist party and being a fundamentalist party, it plays a long game. It was formed in 1925 with the, you know, BJP was officially formed in 1980, but the roots go back to the RSS in 1925. They did think long-term that you know, someday we will have a generation which will not have the memory of the partition which will not know this, these, 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 these instances, and we will be able to create a new narrative. And that's what seems to be succeeding right now. So I completely agree with you that yes, that Congress failed. Congress had the rhetoric. It talked about you know, economic, social, and cultural rights. The whole rationale of the emergency was that poverty will be removed, bonded labor will be eliminated, and we'll make all the changes, but it failed to deliver. And because it failed to deliver on removing poverty, because it failed to make India prosperous, and because India had the so-called Hindu rate of growth of 3% a year, there was you know, an open goal and somebody has to just kick, and that's what BJP is doing right now. Before you come in, Aditi, I'm going to pose a question to you that is coming from colleagues, Salil. Um, people on the, who are the audience, some colleagues are saying, explain to us how you, you know, why is it that India, which has such a large youth population, can sustain the politics of the BJP. You know, one would imagine young people are by their very nature inclined to a more radical cosmopolitan agenda. Why is it that in, in essence here, they're becoming more prone to a particularistic agenda? And I'd like to get your thoughts on that. It's a, it's a great question. I mean, I, I, I would love to know the answer myself. 
The only thing I can guess, and this is only an assumption and a guess, so it is not a theory or, or well-founded opinion at all, is the fact that there is so little awareness and understanding of the history of what constituted and brought, brought India to where it is. The very fact that you are challenging history today through WhatsApp forwards, through TikTok posts, through claims made on Twitter, through photographs shown on, you know, of Gandhi dancing with a white woman, which is of course an Australian actor doing it. And, and, and you're trying to portray that Gandhi was a womanizer. And I mean, I'm, I'm not here to defend Gandhi here just now. Or show a picture of Jawaharlal Nehru kissing his niece and so showing that that's some, somehow something to be terrible and so on. So you have a, a narrative that, you know, we used to hear about when I grew up in India. I, I was born in 1961 and I, I, you heard all these stories, but you knew they were not true. But today, because of the way the internet works, it has gained the currency of being true. And you have people who are genuinely young and, and who do not have access to the history and who are told that the historians like Romila Thapar and others are leftist historians who should not be taken seriously. And because they're communists and so on, this embrace of this new alternative uh, history. And the only way to fight that, I mean, you know, I'm a free speech fundamentalist in, in my other life as, as working with with pen on its board and all that. I just feel that we have to fight falsehood with truth. Okay. Aditi, I want to come back to a question. Somebody asked a very interesting question from the audience. And what they say is when we talk about partition, particularly in the context of Pakistan, why isn't there enough reflection on sin? And uh, how there was displacement there. Of course. Uh, but why is that not un, uh, sufficiently highlighted? Why is that not sufficient? Why was there uh, no conclusion into a partition? How would you explain that? Would you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, I would like to add a little because, of course, since this is not my uh, research area, but like I, uh, because one of the my partition itself is just not a uh, very you know um, black and white it yeah. itself has multiple narratives so you have a bigger india pakistan than you know a sub narrative bengal and punjab and then you have micro narratives like what i am talking about the gnk or the uh, you know pakistan administer jammu and kashmir it is one of the micro narratives that kind of got overshadowed with the politics of the valley so likewise the sindh diaspora were very much there, like I, I did have, because I also studied in uh, Gujarat, Baroda. So I had Sindhi friends who talk about this migration between Africa and, you know, Sindh. And I had a Pakistani friend, very interesting. So she, uh, she studied in Baroda when I was studying and she had Sindhi connections. So she, you know, went back to trace her roots to Sindh in Gujarat, a Muslim woman and who had Hindu, uh, you know, extended family members. Of course, there, uh, there is still scholarship that is evolving. And there are micro narratives that are really, uh, you know, fighting to be there in, in, in the bigger narratives. And I would just also go back to what Salil was saying and what you had posed earlier. And, uh, and I agree to your questions about partition and just clocking it back to the earlier, uh, you know, question about partition itself, that unlike other governments globally who have acknowledged genocides that have happened in the past, whether that's the aboriginal killings in Australia, whether that's New Zealand and the, and the you know, um, and their leaders acknowledging at world forums and apologizing for the genocide, it has not happened in the case of India and Pakistan. Neither the leaders nor, uh, you know, uh, policymakers have actually, political heads have actually acknowledged the wrongs. So I think there is always, uh, and there is, uh, you know, if you don't reconcile with the wrongs of your past, it will keep on repeating, whether that was 1971, 1984, the Sikh riots, 1992, and now the kind of polarity which we are seeing. And Salil was very right that the youth which we really, the India boasts about and becoming the one of the most dominant world economies right now 
is because our percentage of youth is much more than you know other countries of the world but having said that the youth has partial or rather dangerous uh, you know knowledge of history itself which is this uh, you know wikim uh, wikimedia or whatsapp university which kind of uh, you know circulates wrong historical factors and and itself the historical textbooks are being edited now so which is very dangerous for a country where completely uh, for instance nehru's history is being omitted and there are many uh, you know important facets in national building after 1947 what happened where india reached you know so i think we really need to take factor in those things which uh, and be very careful what our source of history is or knowledge is so i mean i'm interested but i want to come back to a thing that you picked up on and i'll come back to it in a minute uh, but i want you to you touched on something about who tells the stories and whose stories are being articulated when you say there is a the acknowledgement by political leaders of their uh, of their states complicity in genocide of one kind or the other right. which stories who owns the stories that are playing out on partition who is telling the stories because it seems to me whether it's the pakistan state or the bangladeshi state or the uh, uh, the indian state the real question is is are we allowing too much of these stories to be told by political entrepreneurs and politicians and this and does does give a particular narrative and is it more important to tell the kinds of stories you saying to aditi the 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 really individual stories of how somebody is both hindu and muslim how they transcend these divides how in the periods of actually the partition as people were being forced uh, in to re to remove themselves from one area to the other there's all of these countless of stories of young people helping each other across the religious divides hiding each other across the religious divide keeping people away from the religious mobs of all sides those reflect the the beautiful part of what it means to be human and how do we surface those stories how do we tell those stories and how do we make that the dominant narrative i wanted to get your thoughts on that can i start with you aditi yes what you said is already been in underplay and for the past i think 30 years uh, you know huge uh, there is huge repositories and archives that are working towards collecting for instance the partition archive in india and the pakistan archive they uh, they have amassed so many uh, oral narratives which actually talk about these stories just not of the violent traumatic memories but about reconciliation about friendships across borders about letters for instance in the uk so i have this amazing uh, you know tape letters that's called so i got my hands on these cassettes when people from pakistan who relocated to uh, the the uk they used to send recorded messages on cassettes back to their homelands either india or pakistan and the repositories are here so for instance this person from india who traveled in 2004 to uh, the contested parts of um, um, you know pakistan so he got a letter from a muslim daughter whose mother was taken away after the repatriation and the brothers married the uh, mother again to a hindu man and she had not met her mother ever and the brothers when he went with the letter said we can't let you destroy her family so there have been also these very powerful and emotional stories when people are trying very hard to make people who have been separated for years so that where the power lies with the people as i said so the whole uh, socio cultural you know uh, what say uh, research and uh, you know academics or cultural practitioners really want to work around these stories and what you saw uh, last i think every uh, since 2020 the south asian heritage month which actually celebrates south asian identities in the uk and in india also we of course we every year we have those so it's basically they celebrate those stories just not of trauma and separation but of friendships and reconciliation salil 
Well, I think we need to know more of those stories. I mean, I'm writing a book about Gujarat and Gujaratis. And, uh, you know, it's a very divided state and puzzlingly slow because if you look at 1947, uh, Gujarat didn't suffer from the partition violence. Punjab did and Bengal did. Gujarat did not. And yet, Gujarat has had more communal riots than almost any other state in India, and which is a mystery. And I mean, I don't have the answer why. But one of the things I've found is the ordinary acts of kindness across the communities are amazing. And I mean, this, I mean, is, is, is a reflection of the liberal way I look at the world, but I'm ending the book that I'm writing by pointing out those stories that there is still hope because this land may have produced Bajrang Dal and all these, these lunatics who went about killing and raping people, but it also did produce Gandhi. And so, you know, there was something intrinsic about this place, which is something worth looking at and reflecting and understanding. And it's not just Gandhi, it's Chakkar Bapa, it's Ravi Shakar Maharaj, and there are lots of people like that. And I think there are stories upon stories like that, because a country of 1.4 billion people, you will always have exceptions, and exceptions can change the narrative. And I think the challenge, because our whole topic today is to look at who owned the narrative, is to reclaim that narrative. And, and, you know, remind people that it is, I mean, you know, I used to go to South Africa as a, as a young reporter um, 20 years ago when Kodesa was taking place and all that. And at that time, you still had Butelezi and there, were, there was violence between Zulus on one side and the Inkata Freedom Party and so on. And at that time, you still had people who talked about the compassion and forgiveness that Mandela spoke about. You know, there was Helen Sussman, there were other people like Zach De Beer and other politicians who were talking about it from a... So I think it's possible to reinforce those ideas, even if those are discredited and challenged by those who feel that it is time to have a more divisive solution. Because otherwise, you know, we may as well close shop and feel in utter despair. So let me pose an interesting question. So a number of people say that why do we worry about India and what's playing out in India? Isn't this true of similar trends that are playing out in other parts of the world? So think about Pakistan, think about Israel, think about Saudi Arabia and much of the Islamic countries in the Middle East. If you look at my own country, think about some of the racial chauvinisms that are emerging in South Africa. Think about some of the particularisms that are emerging in, in Western Europe, where people define uh, Europe as being Christian as part of its historical legacy and not allowing others. So the point um, people are raising is, is India not part of the trend that the world is moving towards particularistic identities. And that what we need to start thinking of is political entities that are largely governed around ethnic identities of one kind or the other, whether they're religious or whether they, they, they're racial or whatever. How would you respond to that? Let's start with you, Salim. Yeah, yeah. So the way I look at it is this, you know, in, in introducing me, you very kindly referred to my essay in foreign policy, where I begin by quoting Nehru and his tryst with destiny speech. So if we look at Nehru and Gandhi as a standard bearers of a particular kind of liberal internationalism of that time, that was a great ideal. It was a wonderful idea that, you know, you could be your religion didn't matter, your gender didn't matter, your sexual orientation didn't matter, uh, your caste didn't matter, but you were united in a common identity, which goes back to what Tagore writes about in his essays on nationalism in 1911, which he writes about when, you know, he goes to China and, you know, he finds the whole idea of Chinese nationalism deeply offensive. So if you take it from that perspective, then I think there was a lot to be learned from that, a lot to be appreciated. And India represented that ideal that here was a multi-everything country, multi-linguistic, multi-religious, multi-caste, multi-ethnic, and all that. And yet it was 
experimenting with democracy after the Second World War to create a nation where everybody could be, and it was the first country probably in the world, I'm, I'm not a Wikipedia or encyclopedia expert here, so I won't go into that, but probably one of the first countries to give universal franchise to everyone at start. It's not that it gave votes to men first and then women, or votes to whites first and then blacks, or votes first to upper caste and then lower caste. Everybody was equal from day one. It was a brilliant ideal. To see that ideal destroyed is a great civilization misfortune. So, I mean, I'd love to come back to that and then I'll come to Aditi in a minute. But I'm really interested in what you said because you're not only born in Mumbai and write about India and Bangladesh, but you live in New York. And New York is in one sense, the city that represents the cosmopolitan identity of human existence. But if you look at the battles that are playing out in the UK, uh, in the US, you're seeing very particularistic identities emerge amongst young people in the way they battle, in the way they articulate their struggles. Uh, and some of it is racial, some of it is uh, uh, religious. Uh, even in places like New York, you're seeing that. Where do you think that that comes from? Do you think people take for granted the very notion of what it is to live in a place like New York or even London, I would argue, which is such a cosmopolitan city. But I am, as a South African, quite struck by the manifestation of what I call particularistic identities of religious or ethnic sense. Does that strike you as somebody who's so steeped in the, the pan, the pan South solidarity of the Nehru's and Nkrumah's. Now, do you think that that identity and that heritage is remembered in places like New York and London? No, it's not remembered, but I lived 20 years in London also. So, and, and, and eight years in Singapore, which is also a very cosmopolitan place, right? I mean, you know, Chinese, Indians and Malays and others. So I'm, I'm used to being in a melange. I mean, so, and I like it that way. I mean, which is why I prefer big cities to small towns. And, you know, David Goodhart had this book about people from everywhere and nowhere some years ago in London. And I think there is something to that, that people who are in urban settings are different from people who are from non-urban settings. Now, I'm, I'm not saying one is, they're different. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I mean, I have my views about what's better and what's not, but that's, that's besides the point here. But yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, I mean, just there's this completely mad American politician called Lauren Bobert who said yesterday that we need uh, a divorce, national divorce between the red states and blue states, you know, and, you know, revisit the civil war in a way. And sometimes you think that's right. I mean, you know, I, I was in London when Brexit happened and, you know, and you had London, you had Scotland, you had Oxford, Cambridge and the big cities voting in one way and, and the hinterland which has never seen a person of color except maybe at a corner grocery store or at a, at a pharmacy voting to you know, leave from Europe. So there is indeed that, that division. And, and the only way forward, only civilized and peaceful way forward is through dialogue and con conversations. I'll and it's back. not easy, it's not easy, we have, but we have to try because the alternative is, is a bloodbath and, and that's not in anybody's interest. I want to come back to that right at the end, but I want to come back to you, Aditi. You, you raised an interesting thing earlier on about diasporic communities. Yes. And I want to pose a kind of contradictory phenomenon that I find uh, playing out in diasporic communities. And perhaps the best example of this is the BBC documentary that Salil spoke about on Modi. And uh, Modi, uh, uh, Rishi Sudak was confronted by this in, in Parliament the other day. And of course he said uh, he doesn't identify with all of the criticisms that are contained in the, in, in the, in the, biogra in the biography or the reflection uh, in the documentary about Modi. And it struck me and it showed me the contradiction. Rishi Sunak lives in London in what is the most cosmopolitan city in one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world. He manages, 
a country that is seen to reflect in one way or the other for all of its failures, a cosmopolitan nation in its complexity. And yet he doesn't identify uh, or see problems with the particularistic identities articulated by Modi. There seems to be a historical, contra there's a contradiction in that. But is that a problem simply of Rishi Sunak? Or is it a problem of too many people? So when you use the example, why is it that people who've grown up in the UK are suddenly fighting amongst themselves about a cricket match between India and Pakistan? For God's sake, you grew up in the UK. Why are you right. caught up in identities around a cricket match right. of a nation you've not? I'm trying to understand that right. historical contradiction. Yeah. Give me your thoughts. I'll, I'll quickly come in because recently I was interviewing a third generation uh, diaspora who traces her roots uh, back to um, Malawi, uh, Malawi and Gujarat. So it's very interesting to see diaspora because I am based in Leicester. So there is a lot of diaspora who's come from Africa after, as we know, Idi Amin, you know, sent a lot of South Asians back. So there is a huge um, African slash uh, Indian diaspora slash Pakistani diaspora here. So uh, I unfortunately I have not seen I have not yet got my hands on the uh, you know BBC uh, documentary I'm yet to watch it but what I really understood by these conversations and uh, you know um, oral narratives of the diaspora there is somehow uh, whether those are Hindus or whether those are Sikhs or whether those are Muslims even the second, third generation people it's it's almost like a time machine and that's also a lot of cultural. Uh, you know, writers and scholars have rightly pointed out whether it's cultural practices or language. So when after migration, a diaspora who come from their homeland, they preserve their culture and language as it is. So even if you go back to, you know, the people I'm working with, their language is pure. Even after, you know, 75, 80 years of documenting these stories, the dialect is pure. So it is as it is. And so is the case of their values. So for instance, I was talking to this Muslim young uh, artist and she is working with a lot of other diaspora women artists. And she was like, I'm surprised when I go back to Pakistan, you know, the women are so empowered and yet, you know, they are doing everything. But here women are still into marriage and they're so, I think, behind. Because culturally, they have still, you know, they hold very tied to the older values and anything which happens in the homeland has a direct implication on um, you know their whatever political stance in the diaspora youth but are you not saying that the the image of the homeland is an old image not the current exactly image. exactly and the current politics though especially the right wing or the extreme i would not say left or right but let's rather put it extreme politics have a very, very, uh, what say, uh, uh, strong impression on their minds. Without knowing the historical connect, uh, you know, context, they are easily they pick up on those, uh, you know, narratives which are in circulation. Yeah. Let me come. And, to and there is a fossilization, Adam. You know, I mean, I left India in 1991, so the ethos I represent is the time when there was still a Babri Masjid, right? So you could call me a person from the yesterday. I keep going back to India. That's a different story. But there is that part of it. And the other is, you know, when you were talking about, you know, Indians and Pakistanis fighting over a cricket match in Leicester, remind me about Norman Tebbit and his test in Britain, right? That, you know, you are supposed to cheer England. Nasser yeah. Hussain, who was a captain of the English cricket team, used to say that, why can't you cheer me? Why are you cheering... Imran Khan or Mohammad Shami for that matter, you know, in, in India for that matter. So I think those are very legitimate and, and genuine questions that, that have to be taken, taken into account in, in terms of, you know, dealing with, with, uh, with how you... And I think the story there probably is how willing is Britain to accept and absorb those who look different or pray to different gods or eat different foods. Can I come back to, I'll give you one quick story, which I think is an interesting one. When I was in the early, I mean, when I was in South Africa in the early 1990s, just before the transition happened, I recall a match in Durban 
between Pakistan and what was then the cricket, South African cricket team. They had just entered into uh, global competitions. And I recall sitting in that cricket ground and a large number of black South Africans in South Africa's definition of black as a kind of uh, inclusive of, of persons of, uh, of, of African uh, uh, and Asian uh, and, and mixed ancestry. And what is uh, what's striking about that is there is a lot of people in those early days before the transition were supporting both India and Pakistan against the South African team. Forward wine 10 years later, there's not a young person of Asian or mixed ancestry of African ancestry that will be seen as supporting Pakistan. In it. They'll all be supporting the South African national team. Because of and Hashim Amla. Thing. Because of Hashim Amla. Yeah, because of the inter how identities yep. have transformed. Absolutely. And I think it's not only because of Hashim Amla. I think no, no, I'm, 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 I'm being facetious. No, I'm being facetious when I mention Amla. There is, a no, shift. I mean. there is a shift of identities yeah. that play out. But here's the final question I want to pose for you. And it, it's really on an issue that both of you touched on. You spoke about Gina. And you said that Gina feared that Muslims would not be accepted. And therefore, he demanded partition. And in the process, Gina established what is effectively uh, an Islamic state what has become an Islamic state. Um, and it struck me that out of this fear of not being accepted, he became what he feared most in many ways. Pakistan became what he feared most by becoming a nation of a particularistic identity. Um, but it seems to me that that's also a reflection of what played out in other contexts. Think about Israel in the post-genocide uh, phase of World War II, establishes a nation that effectively uh, is seen to oppress the rights of Palestinians. Think about uh, Africanism, which comes out of the Anglo-Boer War, and in a desire to make sure that they never oppressed again, they move on to oppress the African majority in South Africa and create one of the most horrendous political systems in history. Uh, in every one of these cases, uh, in the fear that we don't do what happened to us in the past, you end up creating the political system that becomes the very notion of your nemesis. And, and the question that I want to pose to you is what does that mean today? Because there's a whole series of social justice struggles playing out. But I worry that in the fear of not, in this polarized world we live in, in the unequal world we live in, this desire to heal from the divides of our past, we don't behave in a way that becomes the very uh, antithesis of what we want. Uh, because nobody starts off to wanting to be evil. We all start off wanting to protect ourselves, but in the process create an evil because we only protect ourselves and not protect others. And I wanna pose that question to what does that partition lesson bring to the world of New York and London and the UK and Western Europe, because that's what it seems to me, what we want to learn is the lessons of the South for the universal community itself. And I'd like to get your thoughts about that kind of argument. Fascinating, absolutely. Uh, I, I wish I had an answer. I, I do think that what unites people ultimately is more important than what divides people. And the case for unity needs to be made more forcefully. We are not there yet. And I think 
because of the way the Trump presidency, the way Brexit argument played out in the UK, the way Orban behaves in, in Hungary, the way Netanyahu behaves in Israel, the way Erdogan behaves in Turkey, Duterte behaves in Philippines, and of course Modi behaves in India, makes you feel that the strong man, the strong guy is, is the victorious one. But I, I know this sounds hollow almost to quote Gandhi in this kind of a context, but he did say, right? I mean, that, you know, the way of truth and nonviolence do win in the end. That, you know, in the end, you have to look at the fact that you are able to, whoever is a, is a tyrant ultimately falls. And this, this is how Attenborough's Gandhi ends with Ben Kingley's words. And I know it's no solace to anybody. I mean, it's, it doesn't, it's, it's just nice words to make us feel better. But that's the only way to go forward. Otherwise, we live in a time and in in almost despair. So I, I don't want to say whether the glass is half full or half empty and all that kind of nonsense. But I do want to believe, you know, I work on free speech. And, you know, I, I mean, I work on journalists and writers who are in jail trying to get, get them out of jail from places like North Korea and China and Iran. And, you know, uh, through my work at Penn International and the work I do on business and human rights. and And, and you know, People I revere and respect in India are today in jail over this Bhima Koregaon case. So it, it is very, very depressing, but you have to continue to believe that we shall overcome. That is the way forward. I'll, yeah, I'll quickly add to it. I'll, I rightly echo what Salil is saying that, you know, unity wins over divide. And it reminds me of this... Uh, title which became uh, very uh, common in India uh, when this uh, old woman, Veena Verma, visited her ancestral home in Rawalpindi after 75 years. And it said, human uh, humanity over rivalry. So it is actually these, you know, stories of unity and celebration, which talks about this ongoing process of reconciliation. Yes, we are not there, but we are on the path. You know, there is this political narrative which is very, you know, dominated of us othering, you know, one state, one religion. But we have to see that we cannot look from the same prism and whether those are theoretical frameworks, whether those are polit political narratives, uh, whether we talk about, you know, other genocides that happened across the world. And we are looking at Marianne, Marianne Hirsch's famous work on post-memory, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to have our own framework, which takes into consideration, you know, class, religion, caste, the internal divides. And we, we really have to look at personal stories and narratives, which look beyond these social divides, you know, really into stories uh, which unite us. But we've got, we don't have many, much time, so I'm going to ask you to push you a little. So both Salil and uh, Aditi, it's, it's important what you say. But you know, unity can only survive it seems to me, if the case of unity is made on the basis of social justice. So when you speak about Gandhi, and it's important, all of the issues that Gandhi speaks about nonviolence, et cetera. But what is also true is India post 49, post 47, was not the socially just place that it is. Poor people starved, people died, and inequality levels existed. And when you don't take social justice seriously as part of the unification project, as part of the cosmopolitan project, you compromise the cosmopolitanism itself. You compromise unity itself because you don't take social justice. And isn't that the lesson of India, of Pakistan, of even South Africa today, that Madiba? who represents that same tradition of Nehru and uh, if you like, the, the solidarity of the South, uh, Nkrumah, Nasser, et cetera. That is under threat because we didn't take social justice seriously, inequality increase. Is that not the lesson, Aditi and Salil, that we should be thinking about? Let me come to Aditi first. Of course, the whole uh, Ambedkar politics and the new conversations on caste it, it, of course, Gandhi itself, there, there were troops in, uh, you know, Gandhian theory itself. I'm not saying, of course, there is, we, uh, we say Gandhi is the father of the country. And you're very correct. I 
uh, do agree with what you're saying that social uh, injustice caste itself is it's it's like a termite even now in india it's not gone even after 75 years of independence we still hear caste stories or uh, you know uh, couples burned down or you know separated or killed based on caste it's very much there and uh, i would say there are multiple things that need to be part and social justice is definitely a part reconciliation and acknowledgement whether that's by the state of the pe or the people of the wrongs of our historical past a basic acknowledgement should be there and space for the others to speak okay yes. salil you've got a minute and a half too okay uh, so that's not a lot of time but but no but i essentially yeah i agree that it's a it's a huge challenge it's a it's it's a formidable task to deal with and yes we are in a situation where we have a context and a picture which is extremely bleak and 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 grim the only way forward is not by embracing gandhi or patel or nehru or anybody in a, in a kind of a naive manner but to try to see what is it that they are trying to say you mentioned madiba for example you know what is it that he was trying to achieve and what is it that he was trying to do and what is it that's relevant in 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 today's context and time and i think if we were to move in that direction if we were to move in that kind of a context then i think there is there is some scope and hope for for future because otherwise i mean we are in a situation of despair so i think that that's an important point uh, to end uh, thank you salil i do want to say uh, friends colleagues that the real issue that we have to be mindful of is that this is not in partition is not simply what was the tragic death of millions and the forced removals of tens of millions it is as the the forces that underlay partition is as important today for our world and for the for the political conflicts of our world it worries me you know there's a wonderful um uh, show a theater i went to a couple of months ago i went to see something called the father and the assassin and it's a play about godsi and uh, his ideology and his thought and in the in the play itself there's a moment where um, the actor turns to the audience and says what do you think is this only an indian problem do you think this is a foreign problem elsewhere how do you explain brexit itself and the identities that played out and the conflicts that made brexit it's the same forces it's those same identities it's those same conflicts that played out in the debates around brexit that played out in the fights around partition that played out in the struggles against israel palestine that played out in south africa that play out in the middle of germany or the conflicts that are taking place in paris today so the the issues of partition speak not simply to the subcontinent of india and pakistan and bangladesh they remain relevant to our world and they remain relevant to the struggles of the contemporary order and if we truly are desirous of a human community that lives in peace then we have to learn the lessons of that past and we have to learn the lessons and tragedies of both the the experiences of africa asia and the middle east but also the experiences of europe and north america so that we can collectively live as a human community i want to end there and say thank you to all of you to salil and aditi for the fantastic uh, reflections you've had and to all of you for participating for the wonderful questions because it's only when we speak like this when we engage when we think that we can heal the world and the fractured past that all of us come from thank you very much thank you. may you all have a wonderful evening you too thank you bye thank you, thank you so much yeah.